Thank you for coming, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Nuttall. I write the Charlemagne column for The Economist. Um, we're joined by three distinguished speakers tonight. Um, to my right, Richard Youngs, who's a senior associate um, in the Democracy Rule of Law program at Carnegie Europe and the author of this <coughs> fine work here, Europe and the New Middle East. Um, to Richard's right, we have Christian Berger, who is director of the North Africa, Middle East, Arabian Peninsula, Iran, and Iraq desk at the European External Action Service. Um, and to his right, Nathan Brown, who is a non-resident senior associate in the Middle East program at Carnegie. Um, it's an interesting time for European foreign policy, of course. We have, in Brussels, we have a new team. We have a new high representative. Um, we, have, we will soon have a new president of the European Council. Um, and also, I think, a sort of a general sense that after several years in which foreign policy was sort of on the back burner a little bit, Europe was uh, consumed with its own problems, uh, not least the Eurozone crisis. I think there's a sense that foreign policy is back. Um, now, this is largely, of course, because of what's happened in uh, Ukraine and the difficulties we're having with our Russia relationship. Um, there's no shortage of events further south as well um, in Israel-Palestine, in Iran over the nuclear program, the ongoing violence in Iraq and Syria, and a, a general sense of sort of shifting sands, changing regional alliances. So I'm hoping we're going to be able to get into some of this stuff tonight. Um, so without further ado, Richard, please. Thank you. And first of all, thanks to Tom, Christian, and Nathan for taking time to, to engage with the book and, and have some debate around it. Um, the book is not specifically on what's happening at the moment with Islamic State and Syria and Iraq. We can talk about that more specifically, rather, what the book does is to take a, a step back and try and offer a general assessment of how the EU responded to the Arab Spring, how it changed its policies, tries to look at the reasons why the EU adopted certain approaches to the Arab Spring, and also to address the crucial issue of, of how effective um, the EU has been and what kind of impact it's had on political trends uh, in the region. Uh, the assessment is fairly balanced of uh, EU responses to the Arab Spring. Uh, on the positive side, the book argues that EU policy did change in fairly meaningful ways after 2011. The kind of support that the EU offered to um, democratic reform across the region uh, was uh, not negligible in terms of political commitment, new resources, uh, newly conditioned incentives, uh, sanctions in some cases. So these were important changes. There were some qualitative change as well. The EU looked at new ways of orienting its policies more towards the civil society dimension, tried to learn some of the lessons of approaches to reform that had not worked in uh, previous years. Um, and of course, started to develop a much fuller engagement with uh, political Islam, the various uh, movements and political parties representing Islamist movements. So the book argues that in some ways the EU tried to uh, uh, strike a balance, to strike a balance between being too intrusive on the one hand and on the other hand uh, doing enough to respond to the aspirations of reformers across the Middle East. A, a difficult balance to strike. <laughs> But I think the, the EU went some way in striking this right kind of balance. That's on the positive side. Um, the book also then points out that there were clear limitations to how much European policy uh, changed. Uh, the EU tended n has not tended to try to preempt reform. It supported reform where reform has begun to happen, but it hasn't really tried to push very assertively to get reform uh, moving where there is clear resistance to democratic openings. Uh, there's been no major overhaul of EU instruments in the last three or four years. The EU's tried to be more effective in the way that it's used the instruments it has, rather than dramatically or fundamentally change the way that it operates uh, in the region. The book suggests, and perhaps this is one of the key kind of uh, headlines to come out of the analysis, is that in some ways the EU perhaps underestimated the influence it could have had on the Arab Spring, rather than having overplayed its hand. Um, uh, from all the research in the different Middle Eastern countries that I carried out for the book, it's very interesting that there's almost a mismatch between European diplomats saying we have to be very cautious, uh, we mustn't overplay our hand, we cannot impose models of change, 
uh, on the region and a feeling from reformers within countries that the EU is actually really behind the curve uh, in terms of the demand for change that was coming from domestic actors themselves. Um, and one often heard in these countries that European policies were in some ways very appreciated for being sensitive, for being nuanced, for listening to local voices. But uh, sometimes, and perhaps Christian will disagree on this, but perhaps sometimes being a little bit too neutral, a little bit too even-handed. And because of that, the impact they were having was sometimes uh, to militate against reform, or almost in unwittingly to help anti-reform forces. So that's a kind of positive and negative in terms of how EU policies changed and how they didn't change. What did all this mean for European interests? And here the book argues that the EU responded to the Arab Spring as a kind of uneasy mix of risk and opportunity. That in terms of how trends affected Europe's own interests, there were clear positives and negatives. And significantly, significantly because of this uneasy mix, European governments, member states, have tried to regain more control over European policy in the region to try to calibrate their responses to uh, different parts of the region with these very fluid geostrategic <coughs> interests uh, in mind. Um, so for a period of time, in 2011-2012, it looked as if EU policy had to some extent been freed from this uh, overwhelming focus on security and counter-terrorism. But the security dimension was still there in the extent to which member states, national governments, varied their responses to different Middle Eastern countries uh, with uh, very specific geopolitical and economic interests uh, in mind. And again, if one extrapolates from this, there's quite a significant broader conclusion to come out of this. And that is that as a result of the Arab Spring, the EU as a foreign policy act, I'm a little bit more eclectic, um, a little bit more mixed in terms of the kinds of dynamics that are driving uh, EU foreign policy. Part of the response to the Arab Spring uh, happened at the European level, at the EU level. It was about genuinely trying to kickstart or, or re-energize the search for a genuine Euro-Mediterranean partnership uh, but another dimension of it was much more about national governments, member state uh, governments, trying to regain a certain um, uh, role, greater role again, in overall European policy, um, thinking of uh, exactly how to balance this mix of opportunity and risk. Um, and again, perhaps one of the things we can pick up in the debate is whether now, because of events that have happened in the last six to nine months, the dynamic now is, is swinging too much back to a security first dynamic. Uh, so that's interests, uh, impact. Um, the book argues, and of course it's not news um, in this sense, that the EU's impact was relatively modest uh, on the incipient trends um, across the region, uh, but the EU is not entirely irrelevant. Um, the EU did stop becoming an obstacle to democratic reform, as arguably it had been uh, previous to the Arab Spring. Where change did begin to happen, the EU was not the main enabling factor of that change. <coughs> but where change did not happen, where change was resisted, uh, neither was the, e the EU the main culprit um, of why that change was not uh, happening. Um, so... In a way, when uh, reform advanced, Europe was there to help reform. It didn't do anything to try and limit uh, reform uh, too much. Um, but when reform remained blocked, the EU was not really assertive or unequivocal enough to overcome these major uh, blockages to reform. Of course, many critics have said in the last three or four years that the EU has lost all influence in the Middle East, and it really counts for nothing. The book, my book, doesn't go as far as that. It says that, of course, the EU's uh, influence is relatively circumscribed, uh, but the EU is not completely irrelevant. The conclusion, I think, is more subtle mm. than that. It's that uh, Middle Eastern countries look at the EU in a different way today. They uh, are far more balanced. They think carefully about bits of the uh, EU cooperation they want to uh, incorporate and the bits of the EU are key they are not so keen on. So relations in this sense have become much more instrumental between the EU 
uh, and the Middle East, and there is a, the Arab Spring didn't really unlock the uh, potential for creating a kind of common security community, a common political space, a, a political space based on common political values that, as you all know, was the original vision of the Euro-Mediterranean partnership. Um, I argue that hasn't really happened and that relations have become much more balanced, much more varied, much more instrumental between Europe and the Middle East. Uh, the EU is not alone in uh, its impact being fairly limited. We'll hear from Nathan about the US um, policy, which I think also has been fairly limited in its impact. Uh, everyone has talked about Turkey's new role and significant influence, but I think even Turkey has found that it has perhaps oversold the kind of impact that it, it has uh, on the region. So uh, that's interest, impact, and final uh, observations. Uh, just to think about how this affects European policy in a longer term perspective. And just a, a two or three very brief thoughts on this. Uh, it seems to me that if you, if you look in it, at this in a broader historical sweep, um, I think the changes that have been unlocked by the Arab Spring um, represent um, the beginning of a kind of loss of influence, um, a, a loss of European influence uh, in uh, the region. The EU still does count for much, but I think it's, this is probably a point at which the EU's influence will begin a gradual decline uh, in the region. The impact of that is not necessarily entirely uh, negative. I think a second point is that the Arab Spring will, in my view, will probably leave less of a permanent mark on European <coughs> foreign policy than did the experiences in Eastern Europe or in the Balkans in the 1990s. I think these experiences uh, bo both gave a kind of uh, a prompt forward uh, for deeper uh, EU foreign policy cooperation. I don't think the Arab Spring will have the same kind of formative influence on European foreign policy cooperation. I don't think it represents any kind of major inflection point in European foreign policy. I think the lessons to learn from the last three or four years are much more to do with the tactical uh, level of, of how the EU should and should not be supporting economic, social, uh, political modernization, what, what kind of tactics work and what kind of tactics do not work. And final, final observation, just to kick off some debate. Um, the story is clearly not over yet in the region. Uh, many articles today would argue that the Arab Spring is definitively dead, um, but I think the region is actually far from stable. I think there are likely to be many twists and turns over uh, future years in favor of reform, against reform. We will see these movements ebbing and flowing, and therefore, and therefore, I don't think this is the definitive end of a particular period of European foreign policy, but that the EU still needs to think carefully how it can best position itself um, to influence what will be a very complicated long-term period of change in the region. Thanks, Richard. Um, and just before turning it over, um, I should have um, mentioned what the format will be. We're having our, our interventions from the various panelists. We'll then talk up here for a little bit, and then we should have at least half an hour uh, for Q&A with the audience, if not a little bit more. Um, so um, turning it over to Christian for some perspective from inside the machine. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for this presentation that you just uh, proposed. Um, in short, I think I can agree one big exception, that is the title. Uh, it should not be Europe in the new Middle East, it should be the new Europe in the Middle East. <laughs> uh, and let me explain why. Um, I mean, when you look at, at the world from, from Brussels and you look around what do you see, you see um, in a very stable and safe Europe, but you see around Europe um, one crisis after the other. Uh, somebody said the other day to us, uh, the only safe land border we have is the land border with Norway. Um, everything else seems to be a bit problematic in one way or the other. Now, we also have gone the last um, five, six years through, we have seen a number of new crisis situations and conflicts um, arising. We have, when you look at, again, when you look from Brussels, you see uh, five types of conflicts that have been played out in the region. There are two that have been around for quite some time. One is the, the classic, the Israeli-Palestinian split, the uh, peace process, the absence thereof. Um, the second one is the nuclear dispute with, with Iran. So both have been around for quite some time. What has come new um, into, into the play um, after, let's say, 2010, 2011, on the one hand, 
a religious conflict, the Sunni-Shia conflict is playing out all the way from Baghdad to Beirut, um, which has to, which has become more or less one large battlefield uh, for th for that for that type of conflict. The second one is um, Islam versus Muslims, and the third one is um, a population that doesn't really like its leadership anymore, doesn't like autocratic uh, uh, regimes, autocratic uh, tendencies. Now the the latter one, um, I think, uh, has then been translated, particularly in the uh, in the Arab Spring or in the uprising of, of the Egyptians in in January 2011, and has been has been translated into uh, that that the two key demands for uh, a better uh, relationship between the individual and the state, the redefinition of the relationship between the individual and the state, so that they are that they are going to be having uh, political dignity. And the second one, a, a better life. Uh, maybe this was even more important than, than the first one. A better life, um, social and economic dignity for a large part of the population. Now, for these three uh, conflicts, the three new conflicts, we see um, more or less in every country uh, playing out in every country across the region with different a different level of, of, of retribution. Now, how has this 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 transition during the period that that you're that you're describing in, in book, how has this been realized? And uh, I think it was the, the former, um, uh, the former uh, Ukrainian Foreign Minister Marshall who classifies it into, into four types, uh, three types, and now let me add a, a, a fourth one. Uh, I think he, he, he uses the word inclusive transition in the account of the, the Niger, um, where despite all the problems in the end, they came around and, and uh, they managed to set up a political system that includes uh, the larger part of the population, then you have the exclusive uh, transition, and I think the, 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 the model for that is transit for that into the Egypt, where uh, there is transition, but part of the population is not really part of that. Um, and then there is the uh, elusive transition, and an example for that is Yemen, where everything seems to be fine on paper, and then there's a national uh, dialogue document that has been concluded, uh, work is being started on, uh, on, on a constitution, but it just doesn't seem to gel in one way or the other. And then, of course, there is the disastrous transition that I want to add, um, and that's the that's what's happening in Libya and what's happening in um, in Syria. The other ones, I mean, I think you you, you described them in, in, in your book as well. Um, the the kingdoms where the Morocco tourism and, and the Gulf kingdoms um, seem to be less affected by that have have managed pretty well to to get out of this. Uh, conflict scenario. Now, let me briefly go into, um, because I think it's part, I think I said it in your invitation, actually, to the, to the region, um, uh, Syria and, and Iraq and, and, and what I see as being, as how we see this from, from, from the European Union perspective. Um, uh, I think the, what we are, what we are supporting is, is, is of course, the, the fight against, uh, against ISIS, and we see this as a major threat, by the way, not only for us as the European Union, but also for our partners in the region that we are cooperating with, um, with Germany, with Israel, with, with, with Egypt, and, and many other countries, uh, where we think that uh, they are under threat from, from what is happening in the, uh, in, in the region, in, in, in Syria, and in, and in Iraq, and indeed in, in, in the fall of, of, of Daesh. Now, the, the fight against um, the UN, and I think that's important if, for if, if we have European Union work, uh, we have, as you know, we have no military mandate. Possibilities here. We support the, the fight that is going on. We have supported already in August um, the, the clearance of, of weapons and the military equipment for the Kurds uh, who are fighting against uh, against Daesh. Uh, we support, of course, what the Arab countries are doing in Oceania uh, and in other regions in, 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 in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia in, 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 in the fight. But we deeply believe that um, there must be a political solution to this. The political solution we can find both in Iraq and in, in Syria. I think you, you mentioned the, you, you coined the phrase the, the shifting sands and the shifting alliances, and I think when you look at, at Daesh, it's, it's a very good example because they, they have shifting alliances almost every day. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a hardcore group. Um, figures vary how many they are, but they, they build very much on, on those shifting alliances with Sunni tribes, uh, with, with, with uh, urban population, with uh, ex-Bathists, new Bathists. Um, and I think that's exactly where our, our, we should come in. I mean, try to use this in a political sense and trying to break these this, this alliances. Um, there's one 
opening here, that's the new government in Iraq, um, that are reaching out, that want to be more inclusive and work with the, not only the Kurds, and I think they've just reached an agreement with them, but also with the, uh, with the Sunni tribes and not repeat the mistake of 2008 when they were promised all sorts of things and, and, uh, and that was never delivered. So I think that's one str very strong element that we have to f continue working on and we have put, a, as, as, as external action service, we have put a lot of focus on our work with, uh, with the new I I Iraqi government. In Syria, the situation obviously is slightly different because there is no government that we, uh, we can work with. Uh, or that we that we recognize as, as a legitimate government uh, to, to to work with. Uh, so there it is far more for far more complicated um, for the European Union. I mean we have a um, we have elements of a strategy or we do various things that if you put them together maybe are a strategy and the most important there one is um, support humanitarian support. Uh, I know it's not really known uh, publicly but it's the biggest uh, humanitarian operation ever for the European Union with about three billion uh, uh, euros spent so far. The second um, element there is, um, is sanctions. Um, we have a rather elaborate sanctions regime on, on Syria. The problem with that sanction regime, however, is it, it, it's not universal. So it can be easily circumvented by, uh, by others who do not abide by the sanctions. The third element and, uh, is, a, is the political one. And that comes in two forms. Uh, one, working with the opposition. I think you, you refer to it in your book by saying that we were too slow uh, supporting the, the moderate opposition at the beginning of the uh, of the uprising, but politically it was simply not possible at the time. Um, and, this, and, and the second one is is the um, uh, is supporting the work of the new um, envoy of the United Nations, Chef Nadine Mustur, who was in town today, um, and he uh, told us what he what he is going to do. Um, so these are the two political elements. But uh, the point here is it has to be a Syria-led solution. Uh, and, and that maybe is not also the, the only hope of, of turning around um, and, 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 and roll back the um, uh, roll back our ISIS. The the let me briefly go into since it was mentioned I think uh, into Egypt and then and, and then uh, Middle East peace process and then finish with uh, maybe what, what you started to talk about the uh, the review of uh, what we want to do next and, and how we see this how we see this development. Uh, the new new Europe uh, uh, that is going to come. Uh, now on, on Egypt, uh, I think, um, and I'm sure Nathan has a lot to say about this, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be short. Um, we were, we had, we had a choice to make. Uh, and the choice was, do we just do nothing and let this thing uh, develop and, 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 and wait for better days? Um, the other choice was, do we turn a blind eye and just cooperate with whoever is in, in power? Uh, and the third choice was, do we recognize that Egypt is a very important country for us, a strategically important country and partner for us, not only for us, but for, also for the Arab world and for the whole region, uh, but nevertheless um, uh, insist on, on our values and insist on, on what we think is necessary in order to achieve um, the democratic, uh, implement the democratic roadmap that Egypt had set out to, to, to do. I think we have chosen the third one, which is the, the difficult one, because uh, it's, a, it's a very delicate balance to, to, to strike, uh, but at the same time always pointing out where we think things are not going in the right, uh, in the right direction. I think that's where we are um, uh, with Egypt. I mean, you can question the results and the, and the impact, uh, but I think uh, when I come to what you said at the very end, um, this is not yet over. This, this, will go, this, will, this will go on for a long time, as, particularly as Europeans we should understand this because we have seen this in our country as well that uh, this is not an issue, this, I mean this is not um, a, a matter of a few years, this is very often a matter of generations. Mm -hmm. And simply because we see this all on Facebook, on Twitter doesn't mean it goes faster. Uh, it, it, will take, it will take much, much longer than, than we hope and, then, and, and the way we are, we are reacting to, to these to this issues. On the, on the peace process, I mentioned it early on as one of the uh, the conflicts that, that have been around for a long time. Uh, many would argue that this is a conflict if it were no longer uh, there, then many things would be better in the Middle East. Uh, I mean, I know the Israeli argument that this is uh, not the case, and I think they're quite right that there would be certainly something else that, um, that, that would, be, uh, would be used as an excuse um, for, 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 whatever, what, for whatever radical forces want to do. But nevertheless, it's, an, it's, it's a conflict that can be solved um, and, and we have put a lot of emphasis into that. And if that conflict, conflict were solved, 
at least there would be a nucleus of stability, um, at least between Israel and the Palestinians, uh, would, which would have a positive effect on, on, the, on the rest of the, of, the, of, of the region. I don't want to go really into our position, but, uh, because that would require, I think, um, uh, a separate evening, but it's, it's fairly simple that uh, we believe that the conflict can only be solved through um, the by way of two-state solution and integration of the other state that is not there yet. And we are, and, and, and that argument that we hear time and again that we, we, we want to be players but not payers, I think that argument is a bit funny because um, along the fact that we have been paying for, for, for that other state to be established is already a very strong political uh, involvement in this, um, in, the, in, in this conflict. Briefly on the um, on, on what comes next. I mean, you mentioned the, the review. Uh, it's for me, this is also an int a sort of a déjà vu. When I joined the Commission many years ago, the first thing we had to do, we had to write a review of the Barcelona process. Uh, this was in, in 99. Um, uh, I think it was called, the, the, the document was called Reinvigorating the Barcelona process. So uh, I think now we are again at the stage where we have to reinvigorate the European neighborhood policy or find something new for it. There's, there's been a lot of complaint about the, the way the European liberal policy has been, has developed, um, the link between the South and the East, I mean, in particular the Southern countries are not very happy about that conditionality, this more for more principle that I think we have been debating on, on our evenings here. Uh, I mean, all these are issues that, that I think will, be, will have to be looked into, but also one feature of the previous review that was quite important, namely to um, go into the specific needs of the partner countries will be important. Uh, and also to get away a little bit about the rather strict and rigid approach that we have learned in the enlargement process and not use that for our neighboring, uh, for the neighboring countries, but countries that by definition cannot actually join the European Union. I think these are all issues that, that will, will have to be looked into in the next few months and, and, and reviewed and see how we can, we can do this. Now, final point, um, and, that, uh, and, and coming back to your book, um, could we have done anything different in 2011? Mm -hmm. um, uh, that, is, um, that is the question. So what happened in 2011, uh, as you say, and I think you're quite right, we were taken by surprise. Uh, yes, we should have known it, but nevertheless, we were taken by surprise that, that this was coming. Um, so what happened was we looked at the tools and instruments that we had available at the time, mainly under the neighborhood uh, policy, we focused it a bit, we put a little bit more money in, we put, uh, we put more incentives in, focused more on governance, on human rights, on democratization. Um, and, and, and then that was it in 2011, maybe it was enough in 2011. But then after that, maybe some thoughts should have been um, given to what could be a much stronger incentive in bringing the, the, those countries closer to the, to the EU. Uh, again, I think you mentioned them in, 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 in your book. Um, for freedoms or economic, um, economic space and things like that. Um, it didn't happen. Uh, what we offered was uh, more money, uh, market access and mobility. Now more money, we, we were very quickly running out of money. And when you look at it today, uh, it's difficult to compete, uh, to compete with 10 billion or 12 billion dollars that are flowing so into Egypt when we, when we pay about 100, 150 million a year. Uh, when, we, when you look at mobility, uh, I mean, I don't have to tell you what the, what the debate in the European Union is about mobility, particularly at the moment. Uh, even inside the European Union, there's a debate at the moment about, about mobility. And, and, the, and the third component, trade, I mean, again, uh, there was a question of competition. So all the, these three elements that we tried, the three M's uh, we tried to offer, I'm not sure they had the, the attraction um, that they were meant to have, because I think I'm not sure we were we were ready to, to give as much as we were as we were supposed to give. So it left us with the other two M's, more for more. Um, and um, there again, when you when you listen to civil society, we are told that we were not serious about this. We never used our leverage. The question was, did we have any leverage? And I think your book here is again quite right. Uh, I'm not sure we had much of, of that leverage. I think the strongest leverage we have, and we, uh, it's not the money, it's that our partner countries in the region want to work with us, want acknowledgement from <coughs> us, and want legitimacy from us. I think that's the strongest uh, leverage we have, uh, which we have to um, work on in, in, the, in the coming period. I'm sure the Americans are doing the very same thing. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Well, we're going to turn it over to, to Nathan, who's going to 
tell us what us crazy Europeans have been doing wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, some very familiar things, I guess. Um, um, let me begin just with, uh, with um, um, uh, before, before I get into addressing some of the same things that uh, uh, Christian just did. Uh, first, a piece of good news about the book, but then uh, for me, but then a bad, piece of bad news for you. The piece of good news for me is that when I listen to Richard describe the book, apparently the book that he thinks he wrote and the book that I think I read are very, very similar, almost identical. So, so um, that's good, good news for the author and good news for me as a reader. Um, and I think you know, he captured a, the, the, uh, the, uh, the flavor of his own book very, very well, the sort of idea of a, uh, uh, of a mixed record. That, um, and essentially, it's a story of, of uh, politicians who are kind of do, you know, st struggling to keep up with reality and not doing a bad job of keeping up with reality. And the problem is the reality keeps changing. Um, and so that's, that's what the reasons the, uh, the, the, the record in, is mixed. So, so anyway, so that's kind of the good news. It's, it, it, and it's, it's, it's an easy to grasp story. The bad news is that there's an awful lot of uh, complicated detail here that Richard's got a mastery of and that he's got a very good, good way of sort of explaining it fairly clearly. That's bad news because it means despite that clear summary, you still have to read the entire book. It's, it's worth your time. Um, we haven't saved you much time, I'm sorry to say. Um, but what I want to do in my remarks then um, is to uh, basically you know, start a little bit with, with, with the book, say what's, what's sort of interesting about the contribution here, then st take a little bit of a step back and say why is there this mixed record of, uh, of policy and a, and a mixed evaluation that I think would you, you say probably All right. Um, the, um, it, it, the, the book, um, uh, uh, it takes sort of a, a familiar topic, but it takes what, at least for me, as an American reader who's focused on the Middle East, um, are some interesting and unusual angles. Number one, it really focuses, it starts the story not about security concerns. It focuses on reform, democratization, uh, uh, governance. Um, and it does this in part because I think that's Richard's interest, but also because the period that he's really focusing on, the period between 2011 and uh, uh, 2013, was a period when the uh, region itself was really focused very much on domestic politics within the states of the region and on how they were governed. The second thing that it, that's interesting is that it really actually starts, again, as a product of this period. Although it's a book on European policy, it starts with politics in the region. I mean, what is going on in the, in, in, in the Middle East is kind of the driving part to his story, and then how is it that Europe manages to react, and how is it that Europe manages to shape a policy um, that, that, that uh, uh, achieves Oh, and does it manage to, 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 to uh, achieve what it wants to achieve. And the third thing that was very uh, interesting for me to read, and I only noticed it about halfway through the book, is um, the United States is mentioned in the book, but kind of in passing. Sort of the Americans kind of turn up in this and this, and then they were sort of trying this policy, but the Americans had a slightly different take. Um, and I'm not used to being on the margins. Um, <laughs> And perhaps that was that, that's a healthy way, 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 way to uh, 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 tell the story, uh, but again, a little bit um, unusual uh, for me. Again, though, what, what you see is, is a fairly clear overall line, and it is one of mixed record of, as I say, kind of um, uh, struggling to adjust to a reality, but, uh, but, but a record that is mixed because that reality uh, keeps on changing. So what I want to do is to talk a little bit about um, why it is that you have that mixed record during that period. Um, and to do that by st sort of stepping back and taking a l look at the big picture. Um, what I read when I, uh, what, what, what happened when I was reading this book is that it was a book that, as I say, centers on questions of reform, democracy, and governance, and does it with a vocabulary that is, to me, a little bit unusual. Um, democratization it occurs, it's right there on the title of the book, but there are phrases that are a little bit unfamiliar to me, like expanding the zone, the zone of governance. I mean, this is just not the way that, um, 
um, that the issues are understood or debated in, in, in the United States. But essentially what I understand is an, an essentially an approach to uh, political reform in the region that might be referred to as sort of uh, change through osmosis. Um, that you have sort of a core of political practices and political values here in Europe that by expanding engagement with the uh, Middle East, gradually those institutions, those practices, those values will uh, sort of uh, spread to the region. The idea, sort of uh, interesting uh, uh, different and distinct American approaches like democratizing countries by invading them, these don't occur in, uh, in, in Richard's account. Um, and so, and it, so the vocabulary is far, far more uh, subtle. The mechanisms are sometimes a, uh, an awful lot uh, 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 more more subtle. But again, it's it's it's. Um, uh, it's the idea uh, that, that there are fundamental problems with the region, some of which have roots in unhealthy domestic political systems, and that there may be some external role in addressing that situation. Prior to 2011, it seems that, to me that there was an obstacle, or two sets of obstacles that people would talk about, whether or not they were real obstacles or not is, is a little bit less clear, but that people would talk about in, in, to, to, to this kind of approach of, of political reform uh, through osmosis. Uh, first was the idea of, 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 of values. Were societies in the region really on the same page when it came to fundamental political and social values? And there you would hear talk all the time, a lot of it would, that would focus on religion. Uh, and religion and politics. If there is some kind of uh, 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 political visions, or set of political visions that animate uh, a political forces within the region, they seem to mix and, and, and bring religion into the political realm um, an awful lot more and in different ways than uh, um, uh, uh, people in Europe uh, would have been uh, comfortable, comfortable about. So this idea of spreading, uh, 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 expanding the zone of governance might bring um, uh, 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 practices and values that weren't necessarily desired. That was, that was the argument that was, that was often made. Uh, and, and again, I'm not passing judgment on the argument itself. And the second obstacle was, of course, existing governments in the region, which saw themselves understandably as perhaps a little bit as targets, willing very much to engage with Europe and seeing all kinds of positive ways that engagement with Europe at the security level and economic level would bring positive benefits, but not exactly pounding on the door to get reformed into political systems that would perhaps greatly transform them or, and perhaps put them out of business. So prior to 2011, to pursue the kind of gentle subtle policy of, of, of what I'm describing is, is, is a fundamental political change through osmosis would run up against th the criticism often was or the feeling often was was against the societies and the governments in the region. Suddenly in 2011 both those obstacles seemed to suddenly change and fail and fall and so and, and the um, the atmosphere of 2011 in much of the region was one in which suddenly very familiar vocabulary about accountability, about human rights, about, about uh, 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 political reform, about uh, uh, government abuses, about the need to, to write new constitutions, about the need to, for security reform, about, uh, um, uh, uh, about the need to fundamentally reconstruct political systems so that you would have uh, rulers who had some kind of democratic legitimacy and who were held accountable to their own populations through recognizable constitutional mechanisms uh, that involved regular competitive elections and this sort of thing. This seemed to be the uh, currency of political talk within the region um, uh, uh, without necessarily um, uh, having been 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 uh, taught these these concerns, so suddenly societies didn't seem to be so much an obstacle, but ones that were grasping at, for any kind of opportunity to reform in the kind of uh, ways that um, uh, external actors in Europe um, and 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 I would say in the United States as well thought would be in, in the long-term interests of these societies. And second, governments fell. And so rather than being an obstacle, um, the regimes either stepped out of the way, they collapsed, um, or, they, uh, or some of them panicked. Um, even the ones that uh, remained, some of them panicked and uh, suddenly found themselves pressed to offer real concession to uh, domestic political constituencies that were pressing uh, 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 to reform. So 
uh, suddenly the kinds of policies that were pursued at the margins and, 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 and in very gentle ways could become much more central to external actors like the EU and, and, and the United States. And so, and Richard actually documents this uh, uh, very, very well. You have this string of confessions, mea culpas, breast beating, saying we got it all wrong, um, we, we made our peace with authoritarian regimes, um, this served these societies well, they served us long well, we have so much to make up for, um, we should not have downgraded these concerns, we should not have had all these uh, programs that um, um, were um, uh, essentially um, fig leaves or, 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 or palliatives that um, we damaged our credibility, we were hypocritical by preaching one set of values but practicing uh, uh, different ones um, and, and so on. So you have this extraordinary period, not simply in the Middle East, but an extraordinary period of self-reflection on the part of foreign policy elites that dealt with the region, figuring that they got it all wrong, and this was a chance perhaps to correct the past and, and, and uh, get it right. It was kind of this opportunity. Um, and, and, and what Richard traces in his book is the attempt to take that period of self-reflection and translate it into policy. And again, what he finds is, um, I think, um, you know, if, 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 if you uh, look at records of actual governments and of huge bureaucracies, a fairly impressive record of adjusting very, very quickly, but again, very mixed results because it wasn't quite clear exactly what they were uh, adjusting to uh, because the region was changing uh, so much. By 2013, I would say, the, uh, a little bit of the old reality seemed to be coming back. And so this idea that you have a community of values where it turned out that these societies were grasping at the same kinds of uh, uh, political solutions that existed in uh, uh, Europe and the United States was one that seemed to have a little bit less uh, 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 purchase. There was a resurgence of identity politics, a resurgence of sectarianism, um, a, 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 a sudden realization that those people in, those for political forces in the region that presented themselves as sort of liberal and secularist were not necessarily all that liberal when it came to their opponents, uh, but harshly authoritarian, um, and that there weren't necessarily any, uh, that many real seculars in the region. The question was just how they were going to use um, uh, uh, a religion. And that as uh, uh, politics in the region got an awful lot nastier, it turned out that some authoritarian regimes, and this was most particularly true in Egypt, uh, and, and the, and the, and the post-July uh, June uh, 3rd regime in Egypt, authoritarian solutions seemed to have popular support. So this idea that there was a community of values suddenly became a little bit more difficult. Um, and governments within the region returned to their own role of being uh, hostile or suspicious or even criminalizing um, the kinds of uh, 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 programs to uh, spread reform. What seemed to be happening in 2013, basically for the last year or so, um, is a return of the old pre-2011 politics with a vengeance. Um, so what is the, um, uh, the lesson of this? What does this mean uh, 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 for the future? Well, reading Richard's book now in the fall of 2014, even though it's really hot on the press, he comes up and, and covers part of 2014, um, I, I, basically your account the must, book must have gone to press in somewhat in the summer, I think. I'm trying to remember the last event you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, but it's, it, it, it's very current. But there's still this, this, uh, this uh, element in which the mea culpas of 2011, um, which figured so prominently um, in, uh, at, at the time, play a large role in the book. But I think they've largely been forgotten. What has happened over the last year or so, and I think with particular force over the last few months, is a return to the pre-2011 thinking in two particular ways. Number one, the focus on domestic politics of the states of the region is now secondary once again. 
It's not as if it's been completely forgotten, <laughs> but suddenly the, re the, 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 the issues that people are concerned about are much more regional in nature. Sectarianism is not simply a domestic problem, but a regional conflict. The rise of Daesh is a, is a regional challenge. Um, and, and, uh, us, and the second thing is, of course, the return of security-based issues, uh, terrorism, political violence, uh, warfare, suddenly these issues are being viewed once again through primarily a security uh, <coughs> prism. Now, governments are particularly complex things. My own government is extremely complex. Um, and every time I come to Brussels, I come away more confused than, I leave more confused than when I came in terms of the complexity of mechanisms here. So I'm painting with very, very broad brushes. What, what, what I see in the United States and what I suspect may be happening here, if I could see through the complexity, is a situation not in which the t period of 2011 to 2013 has been completely forgotten, but that it has been pushed a little bit down the rug of priorities and pushed a little bit down uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, bureaucratic ladder. When you talk in the United States about what issues in the Middle East occupy the attention of the most senior officials, it, they are now military and security and regional in nature. And it is not as if people are blind to the return of problematic domestic political systems but this is now dealt with at a slightly lower level of priority. Let me go back to the pre-2011 period. And in some ways, I think the, the self-criticism of 2011 to 2013 went a little bit too far. It was never really the case, I think, that Western governments embraced authoritarianism in the Middle East and bad governance with enthusiasm. They didn't. They were resigned to it, and they managed to build, over perhaps the decade or so prior to 2011, a host of lower-level bureaucratic mechanisms that were really kind of, and, and aid programs and dialogues and so on, that were designed to ameliorate some of the effects. These were not necessarily, except you know, for, 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 for a few brief periods, the centerpiece of policy. But they were ways, perhaps, of, of, of trying to hope that there could be some long-term processes and long-term mechanisms set in store while short-term immediate security crises uh, were dealt with. And it seems to me that we're right back there. And we come then to, um, I think, uh, this is in a sense where I wind up in a similar place where Christian did, but with perhaps a little bit more of a critical tone to it. Uh, where you talked about the three paths, and the, and, the, and the final path, and you said the one that we're taking, is one that says, look, and, and it was fo focusing specifically on Egypt, so, so um, I, I will as well. This is an important country. There's all kinds of important things that have to be dealt with in the country. There's all kinds of, uh, of, of security and regional and economic issues. So of course you have to engage with the, with the government, but you can raise a dialogue on these issues, sort of pull out the road map and, uh, and use it as a benchmark and make it part of the dialogue. And that's, a, that's an approach that I think makes an awful lot of logical sense. But I think if there's any lesson of the pre-2011 period, it's that it's not gonna work. It's not going to work because it gets pressed uh, so far down the list of, 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 of priorities that what it does is probably create a series of edgy conversations which are then forgotten on the Egyptian side. Let me be blunt about the Egyptian roadmap. The Egyptian roadmap is a dead letter. To be pulling it out um, and um, uh, you know, sort of measuring progress, the, the, if, if you actually read the text of the roadmap, it falls into two, that was uh, announced by General uh, Abdel Fattah Hassisi, then, then, then Minister of Defense, on July 3rd. It com consists of, of, I would categorize the, the commitments in two kinds. Number one, a series of commitments to a process of political change. Those uh, um, uh, of, of, of elections and constitution writing that have been, in a sense, literally fulfilled, but robbed of all meaning and we know, the, we know the outcome. And second, a set of other kinds of commitments for broader reform about the media, about inclusion of youth and so on, about national reconciliation that have been completely and utterly forgotten. Um, and so pulling this out and engaging kind of a, 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 a dialogue about them is probably an exercise in frustration and fru uh, futility on, on both sides. Um, 
is there an alternative? Um, I'm not sure uh, that there is an easy alternative. Um, but my, I, I can sketch one out in the vaguest details. What it would amount to would be instead of quiet dialogue on these kind of nasty outstanding issues, taking a little bit of the element of the mea culpas of 2011 to 2013 a little bit more seriously. And instead of making these questions of, of quiet dialogues um, um, out of the public eye, fa a far more forceful uh, public line on these issues. One that doesn't necessarily uh, eliminate the engagement on all kinds of other issues. But in the American case, calls a coup a coup. In the European case, doesn't monitor elections that, are, that we know in advance are not going to meet international standards. And being a far more forceful publicly um, in raising these issues. Not pretending that there is some kind of meaningful dialogue on these questions, but being very clear to governments like the Egyptian, yes, we want to deal with you on all these kinds of issues, but we can't use that as a fig leaf for, for masking the fundamental, um, uh, the, fun, the, fun, the, 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 the fundamentally problematic nature of the domestic political choices that you are making. What would be the outcome of that much more aggressive path? I do not think it would have any immediate effect in Egypt. That is to say, I don't think it would make the Egyptian government fundamentally recalculate its, its, its path. What it might do, however, would be to position Western governments a little bit more effectively if there is another round of political change when it comes, when these political systems begin to perform very, very badly and come under pressure, Western governments would, be, uh, would have a far more credible record um, at, at that time. And I also wonder if this sort of um, steady but strong uh, drumbeat would communicate very effectively to governments like Egypt that are fundamentally dependent on strong international relationships for all kinds of security and economic reasons, that they are paying a very significant cost of their international reputations um, by engaging in the sorts of deeply problematic authoritarian practices that don't merely recreate the pre-2011 period, but in my mind actually um, uh, 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 worsen uh, uh, the, the political system. That would be, if I were to sort of uh, uh, read the spirit of Richard's book and say, what is it that the, the people who were saying um, in 2011 to 2013, we got it all wrong, what advice would those people um, be giving today if they remember their words from that period, it would probably be something like that. So I offer it as an alternative, not with any kind of great guarantee of success, um, but with the idea that it perhaps is the only uh, really viable alternative to, for governments that have a whole host of, of interests in the region, security, economic, uh, and, and so on, uh, but who are still very, very deeply concerned that engagement with these governments identifies them with fundamentally dysfunctional uh, 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 political systems in ways that in the long run will benefit nobody. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nathan. Um, I've just got a couple of questions for the panel, then we can turn it over to the audience. Um, there's a theme that was sort of lurking behind some of the points that were made. Um, Richard touched upon it. Um, it's just, it's the, I mean, this is a very Brussels question, but we're in Brussels, so I think that's okay. Um, it's the, the distinction between the actions that um, certain member states may take, um, or de the diplomacy that they may conduct in the Middle East, and what the European Union, the, whether it's the External Action Service um, or other parts of, uh, parts of the Commission may do. Um, one theme we hear about in this town is that, so the, the so-called renationalization of foreign policy. And we, that's certainly something you hear a lot with regards to Russia and Ukraine. So I'd be interested to get the panel's view on to what extent this is something that we also see with regard to the Middle East. And to the extent that it is, um, what room does that leave for the various components of the EU's um, foreign policy to, to have an impact in the Middle East? What is the, the sort of the added value, to use a horrible jargon, that the EU can have beyond what the member states are able to do? Um, so maybe Richard, if you've got any thoughts. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the key themes to, to the book, that I think when we, when we assess 
uh, Europe's position in the new mod Middle East. I think part of a very important part of that um, is the EU dimension and the various common frameworks developed at the um, EU level, the kind of thing Chris Christian has been involved in for many years. But we shouldn't forget the fact that there is the member state dimension um, as well. Um, but the book argues that 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 isn't, it isn't necessarily a zero-sum relationship. It's not always the case that you have the EU um, dimension nicely focused on long-term reform and member states are doing something entirely different. At, at the relationship between the, 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 the national foreign policies and the EU dimension is, is, it varies a lot. I mean, it depends on which, kind of, uh, which country you're talking about, what kind of security uh, interests at stake. Often member states are trying to utilize the EU dimension to advance particular interests themselves. Um, and other times they're basically content with seeing a deepening of the EU dimension, but also trying to parallel that with um, their own uh, national initiatives. Sometimes, actually, when you, when you go to the ground um, and look at the way that concrete initiatives developed in particular countries, they, they work in a very flexible way. You perhaps have the Commission delegation or now the EU delegations perhaps cooperating with a select group of four or five countries that are interested in a particular uh, reform topic. So, um, y um, yes, to a degree, renationalization, to a degree, um, but I'm not sure renationalization would be the right uh, phrase. I think it's more member states mm. wanting some degree of hold on the way that the overall uh, European response um, uh, it isn't led by a kind of Im embedded institutional dynamic, which is how many academics would explain EU foreign policy, uh, but does start from a more kind of outside-in dynamic. It looks at what's happening in the region. That's what the book tries to do, to understand what's happening politically and geostrategically in the region, and then build a kind of uh, um, um, a response from that that actually is based on an understanding of what's happening in the region. Right. That's how I see it. But, um, because the EU's added value. Well, uh, I wouldn't see it that, that, that critically with the renationalization of foreign policy. I think what you see is that you have a broad agreement among member states and the institutions what to do in, in certain regions and, 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 in, and in relationship with certain countries. It nuance, the different nuances. I mean, there are domestic interests by uh, member states or security interests that may be different from country to country that plays into that. But by and large, what I can see is, is that, particularly in the Middle East, there is there's a broad consensus of, of how, to, how to move forward and how to engage with, with the partner countries. You see this now that, you know, with the, with the uh, review of the, of the ENP, this, this, is, this is carried by, by the member states, the suggestions coming in, this is carried by the institutions, understood this has to be done. Um, so I would not be too, uh, I mean, too, too critical about, about that. Sometimes it even is also helpful. Um, that, I mean, for, for, for quite some time, I think our partner countries um, had to do with just with the EU delegations or with, uh, with, with, with Brussels. I think it's sometimes pretty healthy to remind partner countries that there are 28, uh, I mean, Western European countries behind all this. Uh, and sometimes the bigger ones uh, are making the point. Mm -hmm. I think this is very helpful to push European Union policy in, in, in third countries. So I think a combination, particularly in foreign policy, of member states and, and the institution is in my view at least, um, seems to be working pretty well in the Middle East. Okay. Um, one other question before I turn it to the floor. Um, it's the, the interaction between foreign policy and domestic policy. Um, d domestic as in sort of pan-European domestic policy. It's the Middle East problems often have uh, a way of, of washing up on European shores. I mean, you've, you've mentioned the um, security dimension. Obviously, we have a lot of concerns over the potential dangers of um, returning fighters um, from Iraq or Syria and what they may do um, in their countries of origin. There's also the migratory pressures. Um, we've seen repeated tragedies, obviously, across the Mediterranean. And I know that the, um, the new high rep has made a point of suggesting that she thinks that Libya could be one of the most serious problems that she faces um, during her mandate. And we also ha obviously have a hell of a lot of Syrian refugees in Turkey, of many of whom may like to enter the European Union via its, um, its border. So any thoughts on um, how our foreign policy in the Middle East may make it a little bit easier to deal with some of these domestic problems? I don't know who wants to. 
lot. I mean, <laughs> I, mean the, I, thi I think the, 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 the focus was primarily on the migration issue before 2011, at least for a period after 2011. It, it wasn't so overwhelmingly about um, that issue. And I think that the trouble is, is, I mean, some people would have argued that um, seeing reform processes proceed too fast and too deeply, too abruptly, was, uh, could be the main trigger for um, uh, outward migration, and, and that would be the thing that affected the domestic agenda uh, in the EU. Um, but I, th I think to its credit, um, the EU kind of made the point actually where you get an ex expectation from social actors that there would be a degree of opening up, and then <coughs> that being curtailed, that tends to be the thing that drives the, the biggest outflow of migration. So, it's, I mean, it's often suggested that either you support reform or you try and uh, dissuade uh, migration. It's a rather false dichotomy to, to my mind. And I think the EU did try and strike the right um, balance. But I think you're absolutely right because of what's happening now with, um, with um, ISIS. The focus has come back much more to a domestic lens. And I think I mean, uh, clearly one legitimate concern is about the return, the return of jihadi fighters. But it does mean, I think, as both Christian and Nathan said, there's much less priority focus on the big kind of systemic level driving forces of what's really underpinning the, the rise in instability and conflict, conflict across, uh, across the region. Mm -hmm. I agree with both Nathan and Christian. I don't think we're completely back to the pre-2011 days. But the region itself today is so much more complicated and the, the, I think the threats to Middle East order are so much more profound that I think deliberating a, a response to that is much more difficult today than it was in 2011. Mm -hmm. I think what, what we've all seen in the last um, three, four years is that the European Councils or the heads of state and government um, are looking far more into foreign policy issues than before. And they do this because it, was, it has a very strong domestic component. And that's exactly what the two points that you mentioned, uh, the returning fighters and, and, and refugees, when you look at the conclusions of the, of the um, European Council, these are the two points that we very often come back to because it has a very strong domestic. Um, uh, I mean, as we, as we know, uh, quite a few people have complained that uh, foreign ministers are no longer taking part in, um, in, in the European Council, but I think uh, this, this will bring back the foreign policy dimension into, into, into that debate. I think it's, it's, it's quite important. Um, so I, I, I guess uh, this, I'm not sure what, what, the, what the future will bring and, and, and how foreign policy will be, will be included here, but uh, this is definitely, um, these are two points where it, it becomes actually crucial that foreign policy is, is here taken, taken into consideration. Okay. Nathan, anything to add? Okay, well, uh, I think we've got a couple of mics, so um, turn it to the floor. Who has a question? Let me go in the front. Uh, my name is Nawab Khan. I'm the correspondent here in Brussels of the Kuwait news agency, Kuna. And my first question is to you, sir, that uh, you have called your book The New Middle East. Is it a geographical connotation or is it a political one? I mean, what I uh, want to say, do you expect more countries emerging from the turmoil in Syria or Iraq? And Mr. Berger, to you, my question is that about the cooperation between the EU and GCC. Uh, don't you feel that there should be a much more vigorous cooperation between the two organizations? Thank you. Okay. Um, maybe we can take a couple more before we, answer the, uh, before we turn to the, back to the panel. Any more questions? Oh, over here. There we go. Hi. Um, my name is Romana. I'm with the German Marshall Fund. Uh, I am interested in the Arab Spring as well as the Arab-Israeli conflict. And my question is, to which extent, if at all, would you say has the Arab Spring impacted the dynamics of the Arab-Israeli conflict? And in which way, again, if at all, do you think the European Union should tap into those changes? Thank you. Okay, so um, which I think the first part of the first question is directed to you. Yes, so. no, I mean, when I, when I was writing the book, the, the, the concept of the new Middle East was re really referring to the kind of social dynamics that Nathan was, was outlining. Um, the fact that, I mean, clearly the Arab Spring hasn't triggered a, a wave of uh, wholesale democratization across all of the Middle East. We haven't seen that kind of regional um, uh, kind of dynamic. Um, and there's been a lot of authoritarian resilience, a lot of pushback 
against uh, political reform and social protests, uh, but one still feels that something has changed in the Middle East, even though um, uh, most of the regimes have uh, uh, retained themselves in power. Um, in Egypt's case, we had a kind of a transition and now swing back to something that is a very much purer form of authoritarianism. Uh, I still think there's, there's a degree of kind of social vibrancy and social debate and uh, loss of fear or contestation or whatever one wants to call it that, that is, is qualitatively new and I don't think it's something that will, um, it's a kind of genie that can't be put back in uh, the bottle. So I, it, it was within, with that in mind rather than the kind of broader issue of whether we're really looking at borders being redrawn and the end of Psyche Pico and, and all this kind of thing, although that's, that's clearly an issue that's come more to the, more to the fore. Um, to, to Romana, I mean, I have a chapter on um, the impact that the Arab Spring had on both on the, the, the Arab-Israeli conflict and also the, the, lens, the way in which the EU approached the conflict. And it's quite a complicated question. I mean, Christian knows the, the details better than anyone. But my impression is that um, in the early days of the Arab Spring, it looked as if there could be a positive spillover. That because the narrative of the Arab Spring was about self-determination, it kind of filtered in in quite a natural way to uh, <coughs> what was going on in the occupied territories. It unleashed uh, um, several months of social protest in the occupied territories. Um, uh, c citizens fed up with the less than democratic tendencies, let's say, within both Fatah and Hamas. Um, and, it, and, it, and the EU did kind of uh, cotton on to that and try to bandwagon with that degree of social protest. As, as Christian was saying, I mean, the EU's put a lot of money in and it raised the amount of money it was putting into the occupied territories to try and build a set of institutions that were both more resilient but also more democratic to uh, back the holding of new elections. Ver very importantly, the EU did something the US did not do, which was to try and um, uh, facilitate the kind of unity deal between Fatah and um, Hamas. The thing is that the, the overwhelming security dynamic and some of the trends on the other side of the equation were not particularly helpful and uh, therefore there was the kind of pushback against this, this social mobilization in the occupied territories and very quickly we got back to the status quo um, and the EU, it's, it's not that the EU was not doing a lot of very valuable work on the ground uh, but it was, it, it kind of I think reverted to a, 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 the template of institution building that it was following before 2011 so that the Arab Spring didn't really unlock a lot of uh, new potential in terms of resolving the conflict. And because the, the focus suddenly switched to the issue of self-determination in the United Nations and the EU of course <coughs> didn't have any kind of unified line on that, uh, struggled to regain any kind of influence over Israel. I think that if there was a moment of opportunity, it was fairly fleeting and it wasn't one that the EU um, uh, re really was able to, to harness fully. What do you think of these um, parliamentary votes on the recognition of, of Palestine? Could that have any sort of impacts on the internal dynamics of this um, issue? Uh, I mean, it's a, a very sensitive question. My, my feeling is that um, because of the way in which the talks wound down last year, it, it, it would be time to look at... Um, a slightly more direct way to try and achieve peace than, than was built into the Oslo Accords. I think the EU has been fairly patient, but it is, it is perfectly legitimate to be looking at these ways. My, my only question, my only um, observation would be that's, that may be a necessary part of the equation to look beyond the current uh, template, but we shouldn't forget, and that may set up things in a longer term perspective to influence uh, a more productive road to peace. But I don't mm. think the EU should give up on improving the way it actually operates on the ground uh, in, in the territories and looking at m making sure that the, as Christian said, that the EU's put so much money, so much political effort into building kind of proto-state uh, Palestinian institutions. Um, but it needs to look at ways of doing that in a more effective way. Um, uh, getting right it, the, the way in which it engages now in, in Gaza after the conflict. Uh, in August, uh, getting right its relationship with Hamas, if we're talking about supporting a genuinely balanced unity deal. There's a, there's a lot of yeah. short-term uh, imperatives and challenges that EU needs to be dealing with more effectively, and the recognition issue may be part of the equation, but we shouldn't get too diverted by that, okay. would, would be my argument. Um, Christian, I think the second part of the first question on the GCC was for you. 
Right, I think uh, you're absolutely right. There should be a more vigorous cooperation between the EU and the GCC. And I think over the, over the years on the political side, we are seeing this. I mean, there's close cooperation, there was close cooperation in, in the case of Yemen, where there was a close engagement between the EU and the, and the GCC countries to bring about the, the, the agreement that uh, then led to the change of government or the, or the fall of, of President Saleh and the, later on the election of President Hadi. I think there's one example where there was a, was a very important cooperation. The second one is now, I mentioned it early on, is, is the fight against Daesh, uh, where, where we are supporting what, uh, what the countries in the region are doing both in military terms, but also in trying to cut off the, um, the financial support to, to Daesh and, 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 and the political support um, that, is, that is there as well. There is, of course, the downside of that is that we have been trying for almost 24 years to negotiate a free trade arrangement or a free trade agreement. It must, must be the longest negotiations of a free trade agreement. Um, and we, we don't see the end of it. So I think, I think it would be a very strong signal um, for that cooperation if finally this free trade uh, agreement would be, would be agreed upon. Um, so, institutionally, between the EU and the GCC Secretariat, I think we have a, we have a close cooperation. There are regular exchanges and, and, and meetings. We have uh, ministerial meetings. Uh, we didn't have one last year. Um, that was cancelled, but there will be one uh, early early next year. So, uh, but I think we have to build on this. Um, I mean, it, it looks like as if you know that you have two regions, the GCC and, and Europe. They know they exist, um, but that's it. You know, we know we are there. Um, but I think more can be done in, in, uh, in working together, particularly on, on, on the world stage, I mean, in the UN, but also as I said, in, in, uh, in, in the region. May I bri just briefly Please. on the yeah. uh, on the Arab Spring, because I think it, that's an in interesting question, uh, what impact it had on the, or could have had on the, uh, on, 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 on the peace process. I think at, at, at the beginning, in 2011, um, the argument that we were making is because the the surrounding countries, I mean the countries surrounding Israel and, and the Palestinian territories were in turmoil. Um, it would have been very good for both of them to uh, you know, uh, come to an agreement to, to stabilize the, the center uh, of, 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 that, of, of that region. We also saw an influence of the Arab Spring on the Palestinian side. First of all, President Abbas was, was pretty um, uh, but um, he, was, he was anxious that the Arab Spring would also hit him in the sense that the, the population was not happy with the PA's performance, uh, was not happy with uh, and the slogan in March 2011 <coughs> in the streets of Ramallah and Gaza was enough with division, enough with occupation, and sort of modeling on, the, um, on what they had heard in, um, in Cairo. And, and the division part was quite interesting. Huh? It, it was addressed actually at the PA um, that they wanted the division between Gaza and, and, and the West Bank to end. Uh, the demonstrations in, in Ramallah were pretty small, but the demonstrations in Gaza were pretty big. Uh, so there was a very strong um, message there. The other impact uh, you, could, you could see on, on, on President Abbas was he lost his friend Mubarak. Uh, so it was a big supporter. And then you had Morsi, who was supporting actually Hamas, so the, the, the other side of the Palestinian equation. Uh, I think now with Sisi in, in power, now we are back into sort of a normal, uh, into, into a normal relationship. The, the message, I think, that, that has come from us it was uh, we believe that both sides can make peace. If they do make peace, it has a, it has a very important stabilizing effect on the, on the whole region. The argument that we heard from, from many uh, Israeli colleagues was because we don't know where the region is going, it's so difficult to make peace with, uh, with the Palestinians because we don't know what, if, if not their territory would be then used by, um, by radical forces. And again, therefore, it is very important what we are doing that we are building the institutions of a Palestinian state oh. that is um, reliable, uh, whose foreign policy and, and behavior will be reliable and predictable, um, and, and, and a good cooperation with, with all neighbors. I think that's where we, that's where our added value is in, 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 in this equation. Yeah. Okay. Nathan, do you want to? Um, yeah, let me um, weigh in on that last question. And, 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 and the first part I would, I'll just say very briefly, I come down sort of where, where uh, Christian and Richard did. There was a sense in uh, early 2011 that there might be some kind of um, effect 
uh, and deep effect uh, of, of the Arab uprisings on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, both the reasons they also, that they mentioned, and not simply the absence of, of Egypt as a political force, but the return of Arab public opinion as a very potent political force that would force Arab governments to take a far more active role um, um, in this. It is clear by 2014 that that is not the case. It's not simply that I would say that the Sisi has gone back to the uh, uh, Mubarak period, but he's gone actually even farther and done so with popular support. I mean, so at this point right now, um, uh, you know, it, it, un under the Mubarak years, the policy on Gaza was one that was not all that salient in Egyptian politics, but, but to the extent that it was, that people noticed it was unpopular, now it's extremely popular. And there is a strong anti-Palestinian strain in Egyptian, in, in, in Egyptian public life, um, which isolates Palestinians uh, still further. Um, where, I would, where I would disagree is, a li is looking a little bit more uh, towards the future. I, I mean, I think where the situation is right now is uh, partly as a result of the turmoil of, 20, of, of, of 2011, the uh, uh, rise of other um, regional issues. Um, at this point right now, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is essentially isolated. And my own sense is that Palestinians at this point are not simply without a viable strategy, but even without a viable leadership. And, and, and it, it, Carnegie, a, a couple months ago, we did have a gathering where we tried to bring some, some, some Palestinian intellectuals together to try to get some grips on what sort of options Palestinians were talking about. And the impression that I came away with was they weren't. Um, that there's, there's, there's a deep despair within Palestinian society, a sense that all the solutions, the peace process, fat, the Fatah path, the Hamas path, the idea of intifada and so on, had, uh, had, 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 had been uh, proved fruitless and there was nobody who was really able to organize or mobilize Palestinian society in the sort of any kind of vision. Um, and it's not as if the Israelis have all that viable long-term strategy either. Um, the American-led peace process has clearly run into uh, a, a crisis and the number of, of, of believers in it I think is now extremely small. So I think we're now at a period in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict um, where it's time for fundamental rethinking. And, and, and um, I, I don't know what that fundamental rethinking uh, uh, will look like, but an idea that we can simply go back to um, the Oslo process that we can pick up uh, negotiations at a particular point, I think um, is no longer really viable and it's time to start um, thinking about, um, um, the, I think, the um, uh, uh, fundamentally different approaches. And again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being uh, deliberately destructive um, 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 and uh, partly because I don't have an awful lot of very constructive uh, suggestions. But, but I think that the formula of the last five years or so, which was to pursue a peace process pretending it existed, uh, allowed those negative trends uh, to, to develop far more deeply, and it's time to stop pretending that there is some kind of viable process on the ground that just needs to be revived. Okay. More questions? Over here, in the front. Uh, my name is Ragnar Weiland. I'm a doctoral researcher at the University of Warwick and here in, uh, at the UOP in Brussels. And uh, you've been talking a lot about Egypt, not so much about Tunisia. Um, considering the recent elections, I think that would be something that should probably be touched on, upon as well. Um, I mean, Anahta, um, it seems to be the only, the only country in the region which is somehow moving in the right direction. And um, yeah, the only thing that might potentially, or one of the main things that potentially might um, uh, be a problem in the medium term is the economic development and I was wondering how you feel the European Union could counter that and one of the thoughts I have in this regards is that I'm um, not sure how much financial aid is still flowing to Egypt um, but I think it might be a good idea if it was re -divert, uh, be diverted to, to Tunisia instead. I mean not just because, in, not just in order to uh, support Tunisia but also um, projects, for instance, like the, the metro in Cairo, so the EU is supporting the, um, the construction of, of an additional metro line in Cairo, and everybody who knows Cairo knows that this is a good idea because the traffic is even worse than in Brussels. Um, but this is actually, and these kind of projects are actually helping the regime because they are associated, things are getting better for the people, 
but this is not associated with the EU because there's some very tiny EU flag uh, somewhere on, 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 the, on the construction site, but nobody even knows what that means. Um, so it might, be, it might actually be harmful um, in terms of uh, well, creating support for or at least giving successes to the incumbent regime. Okay, thank you. Did we have a question somewhere over here? Yes. Uh, Sophia Kabir, Friends of Europe. Um, I was I was a little bit um, surprised to hear about um, in the beginning. Correct me if I misunderstood, but that that um, the Arab Spring or this region has decreased on the agenda of the European Union uh, currently, and that the um, domestic the discussions about the domestic situations of of the individual countries has been replaced by discussions about the security implications due to ISIS, etc. Um, but you've touched upon the on, on ISIS and uh, homegrown radicalization for a second, and you've t touched upon the migration issues, and a lot of analysts draw direct parallels between the breeding ground of homegrown radicals and migrants, that they actually sort of stem from the same uh, issues within, uh, within the countries, uh, and that they're not so different um, in, in, in what motivates them. Um, but doesn't that basically maybe hold up a mirror to the European Union and should trigger a second wave of interest in the region because it has such direct, the security implications um, are so closely interlinked with the domestic situations um, in the country uh, and those have such a direct impact on, on the security of Europe. Shouldn't that rather kick off a second wave of interest um, instead of decreasing the interest? Okay. Um. And maybe we'll take one more question and then some brief, brief answers over here, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for the interesting presentations. Bernie Kashat, currently with SWP. I have a question about the Gulf countries, which were mentioned also. One um, more for Mr. Berger. Um, with the new commission and the review of the neighborhood policy, the Gulf countries not being part of the neighborhood yet, obviously playing a um, crucial role in the region. How do you think Will the partnership with the Gulf countries be um, be looked at, and maybe what would be the main pillars? Um, what is most important in that regard? I would be interested in seeing how maybe you see this has changed or hasn't changed much, and where you see this headed. And a question for um, Mr. Brown: You said um, there needs to be a steady, strong, strong dum uh, drumbeat towards Egypt um, for the credibility of the European Union. Thinking about the the Gulf countries, Gulf states, how would that translate um, to that field? Could it? Shouldn't it? What's your view on that? In terms of um, basically having a val more value-based foreign policy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, in the re uh, for time reasons, I think we'll have to give the answers very short. So maybe if we can just go through the panelists one by one. We had a question on Tunisia had a question on security and homegrown conditions and a question on our relationship with the Gulf countries. So you may pick and choose which of those you answer. So, um, Richard. So I'll just take a couple on, on Tunisia. I, I agree, I think Tunisia is more or less the, the, the sole success story in terms of reform, but, but I think it's a qualified success story. There are still unresolved issues in Tunisia. I mean, the governing coalition now looks a, a little bit uh, fragile. There's certain um, tensions in the new constitution between kind of secular and religious rights that st will still need to be ironed out. I think the, the, with Tunisia, the EU has done a reasonably good job. It, it is, a, is a country where the EU still counts and where you get this kind of meshing together of the EU dimension and particularly, say, the French and the Spanish putting in um, a, a lot of funding and, and to some extent things working together fairly coherently. I th for me, I think what the EU could have done better in Tunisia, particularly to address the social economic situation, was to move a lot faster on opening up access to European markets. I mean, I think to its credit, the EU um, offered a very comprehensive free trade agreement with Tunisia, but it's such a complicated and bureaucratically heavy um, uh, agreement that it's taken so long even to get through the fairly preliminary rounds of negotiations. I think Tunisia would have done better perhaps with a less far-reaching agreement but one where the benefits were delivered uh, much more in advance. I think the, the EU is beginning to switch on. There was a huge conference in Tunisia, Invest in Tunisia conference just a month ago and because of the elections and the stability there, investors are finally beginning to uh, look at the Tunisian market. So things are, things are moving in the right direction. And I agree completely that the issue of homegrown radicalization should be a, uh, an incentive to look with greater intensity 
at the, at the Middle East in terms of the foreign policy agenda. Before 2011, I think it was all about counter-radicalization. After 2011, it was more about trying to foster reforms within individual countries. I think now we're back to more of a counter-radicalization agenda. And for me, the, the question is actually how you synthesize that focus on counter-radicalization, as Nathan was saying, <laughs> while keeping uh, in focus the need to look at more kind of structural, political, economic, and social reforms in the regions themselves. That, that doesn't provide an, an easy panacea or uh, uh, antidote to homegrown radicalization, but I think it's one necessary part of the equation. Okay. Question? Uh, one and a half answers, if I may. Um, the half answer is on the, on the metro line in Cairo. Um, I think it's a loan, actually, from the European Investment Bank and not, not a grant, so it's difficult to shift it to, um, to, to Tunisia. Um, but we have taken a deliberate decision to support socioeconomic um, activities in Egypt. It was a decision taken uh, about a year ago. Um, and I think whatever you do in that area, in the end, can, I mean, the, the government can say this is to their benefit. So it's, 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 I mean, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult decision to make. For example, we're running a major um, uh, school feeding program in Upper Egypt. I mean, it's for the kids, but the government can say, you know, it's, it's also far. So it's, it's a very difficult choice to, uh, choice to make. But I think you're right, traffic is far worse than Cairo, so I think a good metro line would, 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 would really help. Um, the full answer is on the, um, on the Friends of Europe, the, on, 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 on the sort of the, the security aspect. And I, I come with a, maybe with a boring answer, and, and that, that we've been discussing all of last year is we need to have a comprehensive approach to things in, um, in third countries. I think security is, to the, is at the forefront, and of course member states have a particular interest in this, but when you go and address economic issues, um, democratization issues, human rights issues, governance issues in general, I think you also address in a way the security issues. I think that's where, where, where I think our, our, our task will be in, in, in the future, to factor that in as well. I mean, security sector reform, for example, uh, is a development cooperation uh, activity. So I think we should, not, we should not forget that, that it will then also help, help to, to, to improve the um, security. Um, so looking at it and what's happening in the region through, through lens of, of, of security would not give credit to, to what's happening in the region. So we really have to have all our tools, instruments ready to, 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 to address all the security issues. Thank you. Nathan. Um, just a quick response on the, uh, the Gulf, uh, the question about uh, uh, the Gulf in Egypt. The question's a good one. It's much better than any answer I could give would be. So I will just make two observations that are, that are germane to the question rather than uh, uh, answer it directly. Uh, the first is that this, interestingly, the Gulf is one region where the domestic politics still is a lot because we're not talking about GCC here. We're talking about individual Gulf states and they're very, very different sometimes because of their own uh, 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 domestic politics. Um, you're talking about Saudi Arabia and especially the UAE. Um, you're not talking about Kuwait, for instance, which has a um, um, its own Muslim Brotherhood movement. And so so you're, you're really talking about a fractured uh, um, uh, 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 GCC and individual Gulf states. But the, se the second observation is that we are entering as a strange period for that reason when um, the strategic vision of many of these states and that of the uh, Western states that have been so closely aligned with it have begun to diverge on domestic issues in Arab states and especially about Egypt. My guess is that the kind of policy that I was at arguing for, which would be a much more robust public uh, 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 raising of uh, governance and democracy and human rights issues with Egypt, would be much more successful if there were any possibility of coordination with the Saudis and the Emiratis, and there's not right now. So uh, that's why I'm advocating it as a long-term rather than a short-term policy. With that kind of cooperation, which is of course in, uh, unlikely even impossible, um, I think the Egyptians would come under very, very severe pressure. It's not going to happen now, uh, partly for that reason. Okay. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there, but um, I've been told that there is some, a delicious Middle Eastern spread waiting for everybody, so hopefully that will entice some of you to stick around, um, and I hope some of our panellists will as well. But um, for now, thank you very much. Thanks very much.